Elon Musk is accused of sexual misconduct at the same time he's trying to purchase Twitter. This seems a little odd in its timing, at least to me. We'll talk about that. And then we'll also say goodbye to Pete Davidson, who over the weekend left SNL. And then we'll look at Dave Chappelle and his attacker. His attacker spoke out for the first time, and we hear what his justification for tackling Dave Chappelle on stage really was. We'll talk about all that and more today on Indie Thinker. Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning into the show today. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Sharing is caring, so if you truly care and you truly are benevolent, then let me arm twist you just a little bit as we'll kind of talk about today and just encourage you that the only way that you can truly show people you care is by liking, sharing, and subscribing this uh, to this podcast. So thank you for doing that. Um, now, we're headed quickly into the summer. Kids are leaving school. And I bet you've got some cool summer plans. You can leave that down in the comments section below. But as we are prepping in my house for summer, um, I, I, I wanted to share one thing with you. So the other day, we were driving home from church and we were talking about a friend of my youngest boy who was five and he wasn't in church. And so we said something like he's sick and then my son chimed in and said, oh, does he have leprosy? So uh, we all laughed in the car because we thought that was pretty hilarious that he said he's, that he's got leprosy. Now, obviously he heard that from the Bible, but my son conjured up in, in, his, in his young mind a uh, thousands year old disease, flesh eating disease that people had in the Bible and still have to this day, but very, very rarely uh, have uh, to suggest that, that his friend was sick of that disease. Now, the reason I bring up that silly example is because it's, it's a little bit funny that a child would say the word leprosy, uh, but also to illustrate a point that, uh, that kids are really shapeable and they are actually kind of like you know, just little clay molds that we can shape and mold in any kind of way that we see fit. Like, I mean, I heard the other day, uh, what was his name? Like Echo Charles, I think, is was on the Joe Rogan podcast. I think it was an old episode, but I was just kind of scrolling through some things. And I heard him talking about him trying to indoctrinate his son into the love of Bruce Lee. It was a really funny story, but ultimately he convinced his son that Bruce Lee was the greatest martial artist that ever lived. Whether that's true or not, the point is, is that you can shape and mold your kids. Um, and, and it's our job as parents to do so. So as you dig into the summer, I encourage you to find ways, productive ways, to shape and mold your kids into thousands year old doctrines that you can find in the church and maybe some other things like get off the phones, go outside and that kind of thing. Um, but nonetheless, anything that would be healthy for your kids. Now we're going to dig into some, uh, some manipulation kind of on a negative way, not the good kind of manipulation that you can get your kids kind of uh, to follow through with if you encourage them to get off their phones and get outside and actually go explore nature. Uh, but, uh, but we're going to get into some kind of negative manipulation, as it were, today uh, and, and talk about that just because I think it's so important for us to kind of exercise our muscles in places where we're often told not to go. And, and I'm going to tell you why. But before I do that, I want to make sure that you know in the show notes here of this show, in the description of this video, if you're watching on YouTube, you can find our sponsors. One of our sponsors is Element Funding and the Kevin Blair team. If you need anything in the shape of a mortgage, if you're looking to refinance, looking to purchase a new home, I want to encourage you to go check these guys out. At least go see what they can do for you. You can pre-approve for a home loan totally for free. So go in that description. You can find that link. You'll see it on the screen too. Go to kevinblairteam.com and see how they can help you if you are in the market for a new home or to refinance your home. And when you do so, make sure to let them know that Indie Thinker sent you. So over the weekend, it was a, uh, a soul-crushing time, a, a heartbreaking moment that uh, we as a nation observed here in America as we said goodbye to Pete Davidson from the cast of SNL. So in homage to Pete Davidson, I wanted to give just kind of a brief montage of some of Pete Davidson's funniest moments. So here they are. Oh, that's the tattoo. Yes, I got it. Yeah, I did. I've seen it on the, the, the news. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did too, it's apparently. It's the number one story. Yeah, apparently when I take a <laughs> it's like a new. <laughs> you know you can't say that word on television. Yeah. Oh, uh, hey, man, you asked me to be on here. You know, like, sir, we have a situation. That's not how I found out. I was leaving my building and my doorman said, yo, man, 
Somebody trying to kill you. I went into a gas station to get like a Slim Jim, and this of course guy, this yeah, and this guy just like eat out behind the closet where he was working in there, and he was just like, "Trump's a good man." <laughs> And I was like, what? He was like, he's a good man. And he kept like getting closer to me and I just kept backing out <laughs> oh of the gas station into my car and he's like, he's a good man. I am 17, so unfortunately for you ladies, you know, keep it down. You ever have a black guy compliment your sneakers? <laughs> Yo, I get like a little schoolgirl that just got asked to prom. <laughs> I go crazy. One time this black dude was like, yo son, those kicks are fresh. <laughs> I was like, oh. Chris Rock staring at you when you're not doing well is very, very intimidating. Oh, no. Because he just looks at you kind of like, really? Uh, <laughs> is that what you wrote? And you're like, yeah. I've shorted it like out and been like, yo, I got to go home. <laughs> Where were you? I don't, like, I've been like to friends' houses and like, you know, watching the game and like, you know, getting a little too confident. And then, hey, woo, yeah. down. And then you know, thinking it it's not going to be wet. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. He is really really going to be missed. I mean, where do you go from here? He's at the pinnacle of his comedy career, as you can tell. It, there's, there's only down to go from where he's at. Okay, deadpan sarcasm aside, um, I'll just, I'll put my Christian hat on for a moment and just say this. We're, we're praying for you, Pete, as you take on your next step, whatever that may be, and uh, pray that you and Kanye can find a great, great way to relate to one another moving forward in the future. Pray that you guys will just be thick as thieves, brothers almost. Okay, now, sincerely, all joking aside, um, I, I really wanted to bring this up just because I have a sincere question. I am really not trying to poke fun uh, or to be mean-spirited here. I really, really want to know, um, what is the deal with, with Pete Davidson? Um, I honestly have never found anything that he said funny. And I'm, I'm curious, is this because like comedy has moved on beyond my generation or maybe just me personally, so I don't like lump everybody in my boat, God forbid, but like has comedy just kind of evolved to the point where it's no longer funny to me anymore? Maybe it's like, like this, okay, so my dad loved Chevy Chase and loved Dan Aykroyd and loved uh, uh, Bill Murray and those guys in, the, in that original SNL cast. And then probably when uh, Chris Farley and Adam Sandler came along, he was like, ah, oh, these guys are nothing like those dudes. So it could be that kind of nostalgia element, except for the fact that my dad actually loved Chris Farley and loved Adam Sandler and all those guys. Um, <laughs> but needless to say, it could just be that there's that nostalgia element and, and, and that's what's, what the missing piece is for me. Or it could be that we're experiencing something in comedy that signals something much more culturally significant. And I actually think it's the second one. So, so hear me out on this. I just kind of wanted to bring this up for this purpose, to kind of look at comedy in its present state. Because there's a lot of people that believe that what we're experiencing in America especially is kind of a cultural moment where things have gotten so politically correct that comedy is slowly but surely dying. I mean, I can throw up this uh, report from Quartz here. Just looking at Fox alone, in 2010, 44% of the films they released that year were comedies. Now, just a short four years later, 8% of the films they released were comedies. So is this signaling that comedy is changing in our mix and that maybe comedy is dying because of political correctness? So uh, you may also say, no, Reed, the reason that number that you just quoted is changing is because of like Disney and superheroes and, and animated features and those kind of big budget box office things that comedy is no longer in the market and uh, really that important because those things have taken their place and it's hard to compete against those kind of movies. Well, it probably is a little bit of both, but I, but I definitely think it's worth suggesting that comedy may be changing in our time because of political correctness, and it's just making us less funny because we're finding that there's less material the more politically correct we become. Maybe there's another way of saying this. Has cancel culture arrived at a cultural moment to where it's more dangerous to be funny and therefore more and more people are staying away from it? Needless to say, I could be totally wrong, and, and, and I want to hear from you. So down in the comment section, if you've got like a clip where Pete Davidson was actually funny or a comedy special or a, a segment of that comedy special, uh, please share that with me because I would love to change my opinion about this. But otherwise, I'll stay 
pretty much galvanized in the position that Pete Davidson has never said a funny thing in his life and the whole Pete Davidson craze uh, just leaves me totally bewildered and probably many more uh, of you bewildered as well as you as you stare in amazement at a guy that is patently not that funny and wonder how he became so so popular and and I can't help but suggest and so it's just food for thought here it's nothing directly about Pete because I think it maybe is a signal of something broader. If it's true that things like comedy and film and the arts reflect the values of a society, then we must ask the question, what does this say about our society? And I have some thoughts on that and I'll show them to you as we jump into our headlines today. So you probably have heard by now that Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla and the founder of SpaceX, was just recently accused of sexual misconduct. Now, this allegation goes back all the way to 2018, and there's an alleged payoff to this person in the amount of around 250, something like that, thousand dollars, to maybe 290. $290,000. Now, this is an alleged payoff, not, not anything that's been proven yet. Uh, payoff to this individual. And so the question comes in the midst of this is why is Elon Musk being accused of sexual misconduct? Because just recently, Musk has challenged the person and called that person a liar and did so on social media. And he also kind of intimated prior to this that hey, watch out, political attacks are gonna come my way as I'm trying to buy Twitter. Now, here's the deal. This really seems oddly convenient to me that just at the same time, Musk is trying to purchase Twitter and Musk is making moves and quite frankly, many of those moves making enemies of those on the left, that something that is very leftist in nature is starting to happen. He is being accused of sexual misconduct. Now, let me step back and just say this, that. I, I mean, I, I want to be fair, right? It's possible that these allegations are true. It's possible that Elon Musk is guilty of this. But we also have to be logical about this and just say what logically follows here. Is it more likely that this allegation is true or is it more likely that this is yet another extortion attempt against Elon Musk to keep him from buying Twitter, to keep him back down? So let me just posit the big if here. If Elon Musk did not actually do that, then it seems oddly, oddly convenient that these allegations are coming out at this time. So what does that tell us? This is a page from the leftist playbook. Tell me this hasn't happened with Brett Kavanaugh. When Brett Kavanaugh was gonna be the Supreme Court justice uh, pick of Donald Trump, of course they immediately threw trumped up allegations. Uh, against Kavanaugh, but it's not the first time this happened. More than 10 years before Kavanaugh was, was going to be uh, on the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas had the same allegations thrown at him when he was being nominated to the Supreme Court. And he stood up and he said, this is a first class lynching uh, against a black man who's come into odds with a Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party has a, does have a playbook. They have a history of doing this, throwing up false allegations against somebody to try to intimidate them. So here's the point. This is not too odd in society. Specifically, I can relate to this as a Christian. I'm asked difficult things all the time. Things like this. Do you really believe in hell? And am I going there? Is homosexuality a sin, really? We're asked these questions all the time and usually, the answer to the question isn't important to the person because it, it's really an, an attempt to make an implicit statement. And here's the statement. You're not loving if you contradict how I feel. So don't worry, Christians, we're, we're not alone. Uh, for those of you in society, you're asked all the time too. This asorbic society questions you with things like this. Do you believe that the world is going to end in 12 years if you don't do something about it? And if you say no to that, you say, what, are you some kind of climate denier? And then things like this. Why would you ask about the effects of an abortion on a mother-to-be? Why are you asking those questions? You're not trying to strip away a woman's rights, are you? All of this is extortion. They're all bully tactics. And this seems to be what's happening with Musk. They are questions not really intended to come up with answers. They're an implicit demand. It's a conform or else. And unfortunately, it's a very powerful tactic and it works as long as people remain silent and they're too cowardly to broach subjects. But we cannot fall for this extortion. 
I know, I, I'm tempted too. I want people to like me and I want people to perceive me as a good person. And, and when something doesn't feel good, I run in the opposite direction. But as a Christian, I realize something that in the process of intellectual endeavor, I am not called to sacrifice truth on the altar of feelings. Now, I need to be careful in the way that I dispense truth. Agreed. But, but it doesn't mean that I shy away from it. But in a way, this is the extortion that's being pulled over on Elon. The left seems to be saying, we don't like what you stand for, so we're going to extort you until you start saying what we like. You either do what we say or we will endlessly slander you and we'll do so in a perfectly legal way so that you can't come back and accuse us of slander. We'll bring false allegation against you over and over again and your rap reputation will be in shreds, not to mention your mental and emotional energy. And people will think you're something that you're not. And you'll be so tired of fighting that, that those tendencies and those lies and those allegations, you'll be so tired of that that you'll finally just give in and say, it's not worth it. This is the tactic. By the way, it's called cry bullying. It's defined as a person who engages in intimidation, harassment, or other abusive behavior while claiming to be a victim. You see that? This is, this is why victimization is so popular nowadays, is because then you can, you can cry bully people into, into what you want. In a way, this is what I was talking about when I addressed Dallas Jenkins' statements just the other day on the podcast uh, on Mormonism. I'd encourage you to check that out because, um, but I th I, because I think it was hopefully a very thoughtful offering. I, I think The Chosen is great. I think Dallas Jenkins is great. But his statements about Mormonism were not great. And I think we should be able to talk about that. And I can't help but wonder if he hasn't made the decision to avoid the controversy, to avoid the bullies. And that's why he said what he said about Mormonism in the LDS church, that it's possible for his four LDS friends to be Christians when the whole LDS movement is based upon patently non-Christian ideas. So his comments tell me something. That They tell me that it is at least possible to live in a world where we don't talk about the truth because we're scared of the repercussions. And trust me, there are people out there who want you to feel those repercussions so that you don't broach these subjects. Caving to social pressure is a powerful temptation. Again, I'm tempted all the time to flee conflict, to make myself feel better. But as a Christian, I know that that, that is self-centered. And so I don't need to ask, how does it feel? I must ask if it is true. But very often, I'm, you know, it, it's called nitpicking, it's called stone throwing. All of those are attempts not to have intellectual conversation. Now, of course, people, people can throw stones and people can nitpick. Let me just give you another example of the Dallas Jenkins thing. So people saying, oh, Dallas, you're, you're working with an LDS company. Okay, fine, who cares? Like all sorts of companies make movies that you watch and trust me, they do not have your values. The real question, and I think it's a fair question is, is the LDS community or those friends of yours, that production company that you work with, are they influencing the way The Chosen is being created? And I'll go ahead and say, I don't think it is. But it's totally a different thing to step outside of the, the success of The Chosen and how impactful it's been to many people's lives, which it has been. It's a total another question to, to ask the question uh, that, that Dallas question beg, that Dallas Jenkins begs, forgive me, when he, when he says that his 40 LDS friends love the same Jesus and, um, and they are Christians. Okay, so, so we put the success and the power and the beauty of the chosen to one side and we answer that question and we say, uh, in no uncertain terms, the answer to that has to be no. So it really doesn't really even have anything to do with Dallas at the end of the day, it has to do with ideas and we need to be willing to discuss those ideas without fear of reprisal. But we're often encouraged to tiptoe around the truth and we fall for that because when we stand strong, we learn. Again, that there is a social cost attached to things like resisting the Black Lives Matter movement. We'll talk about that here in just a moment with Jonathan Isaac in his new book, The NBA Player. Uh, there's, there's repercussions when you stand against the sex transitioning of children. And, and by the way, the reason it's important to, to pay that social cost is because when you pay it, you realize it's not as bad as you think. You learn that the arguments that so many people try to trump up 
uh, with fear are, are done so because they understand that their ideas are not strong and they will crumble like a house of cards if you actually gently push against them. And it actually gives us the ability to provide a helpful and life-giving alternative if we're willing to push against these social pressures. It provides a counter-cultural alternative that people need desperately right now. Because woke ideas and woke people are starting to come up against a wall. And the question I have is, has the church, have Christians separated themselves enough from the woke social justice movement to stand as an alternative to it? Because people have deconstructed their faith and they have found that idolatry is on the other end of it and it's not helpful. They've read the anti-racist books and they've come away realizing these people are really being racist. And they realize the fundamentally flawed nature, nature of cancel culture. And, and having imperfect people mob you for your ideas. And all of that will eventually run its course and people will go the opposite direction screaming. And where will they run when the culture begins to cannibalize itself? Hopefully there'll be a bunch of churches who stood against those lies that were peddled specifically by leftists. They'll stand against the lies of equity and the lies that the social justice movement has by and large told. Um, as, when it's been stripped away from, from Christian ideas. And, and hopefully those people will flock to churches for fresh water from fresh wells. And I can show you that this is going to happen because it's already starting to happen in small ways and it's happening at Netflix. You'll see this in our next headline. And this is an opinion piece over at the newsroom. Netflix is backpedaling from woke mind virus and it cancels several programs. So not long ago, Elon Musk went to Twitter and he accused Netflix of being woke and that their woke ideas and their woke content was going to be the death of them. Now, that was in the wake of a 20% share drop for Netflix as a company. They have been consistently dropping ever since. And according to this same report, for the first time in more than a decade, the company reported it lost 200,000 subscribers during the first quarter of 2022. Shares of Netflix dropped by 20%, making matters worse. The company expects to lose 2 million subscribers in the second quarter, according to street account estimates. And between October 19, 2021 and April 19, 2022, the stock value dropped 67%. The suspension of its service in Russia also resulted in a loss of 700,000 subscribers. And if that's not enough, there's also right now a shareholder lawsuit coming against Netflix for not reporting some of these losses and the impact of these losses uh, to its fullest extent. So the shareholders are suing, suing Netflix right now. So it really seems that there's kind of this reckoning happening um, at Netflix. So I want to show you some of the content that's been going to Netflix uh, and has been taken off of Netflix as a result of some of this kickback because it sure seems that they uh, believe that, that some of this content has become a liability to them because this report will go on to tell us a couple of different things. Like for instance, Netflix has backed out of a number of far left films such as a show about the life of Colin Kaepernick, the failed NFL quarterback who was cut and shamefully sh sued the league. Netflix has canceled a number of programs, including a cartoon called Anti-Racist Baby. That's Ibram X. Kendi's children's book about becoming an anti-racist and how to raise up a new generation of anti-racists. The company has also canceled Wings of Fire and with kind regards from kindergarten, Netflix has reportedly canceled Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, a documentary about race in the United States. And most importantly, and most beautifully, I have to add this next one. The streaming service has canceled a series created by British Duchess Meghan Markle. The series called Pearl is based on Markle's own life and starts with a 12-year-old girl who was inspired by various historical women. Now, I want to be as charitable as I possibly can here, but I just have to be honest with you. I, I don't know that there was an audience for Meghan Markle's life story. Um, so, needless to say, uh, Netflix is experiencing right now kind of the backlash of going woke. I mean, it's a saying that I didn't come up with and it may be cliche at this point in time, but it can't be too cliche if it's true. Go woke and get broke. And that's what's gonna happen with so many more companies. But, but here's the reason I bring this up. Not because uh, I think you should cancel your Netflix su subscription. That's, that's totally up to you. Um, I bring this up just simply because of this. Because when people leave places like Netflix, where are they going to go? 
They, they need an alternative to which they can turn to. They need people who have not been giving in to the social pressure and have not been giving in to the extortion and have not been giving in to the cry bullies and just saying, okay, whatever you want, I'll say whatever you want, just make sure you call me a good guy and make sure you think I'm a nice person. They need people who have, have, who have provided thoughtful and engaging content that that once that stuff has run its course, people can turn to. So I already kind of mentioned this, so we could just leave it at that and just say, the woke mind virus is, is real and we need to make sure that we don't fall for it. We need to make sure that we mask up spiritually and intellectually so that we can stand against it and that we're not afraid of the truth. Speak it as lovingly as you possibly can, but do not back away from it. And I, I think this last story will kind of put a nice, bow on on that very idea because Dave Chappelle's attacker has spoken out. And according to the rap, the assailant said, I wanted him to know what he said was triggering. So this guy attacked Dave Chappelle on stage and this was his statement after that attack. For those of you who maybe have missed out the attack on Dave Chappelle, one of the world's best comics, uh, if not the guy that's at the top of his game, the 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 greatest comic of our time. Uh, he was doing a show and then he was attacked by this man. So here's a clip of that. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for hip hop history. So I know what you're asking. Why do we care what this guy said? Because we typically don't describe any kind of well thoughtful, thought through response to these kind of people who are willing to attack somebody publicly and who's willing to, you know, do so with a knife that looks like a gun. If you haven't seen it, then just take my word for it. You know, why do we care what this guy has to say about this attack? Well, the only reason we do care about it and the only reason it is being reported, I think, is because we are supposed to believe that, that Dave Chappelle should be sorrowful for his, his comments, for his comedy. After all, the guy says, I'm a bisexual and I'm homeless, and Dave Chappelle has made fun of bisexuals and homeless people in the past. And so we're supposed to believe now that we need to be a little bit more, more mindful of these jokes so that, so that we don't hurt people's feelings like this. Now, there's two ways to look at that. The one I just explained, or the second option that the people who use the word triggered, that you know they're triggered by comedy or they're triggered by the fact that Dave Chappelle would talk about uh, the LGBTQ community or triggered by the fact that he would talk about homelessness. Those people who use that word triggered are actually insane because this is not decent behavior or sane behavior. This is the behavior of somebody who doesn't understand how society works. And for those kind of people, they are given medicine, they're given jail time, or they're given time away from society so that they can be reoriented into what a good and healthy society actually looks like. Now, I'm not gonna go as far as to say anybody that ever uses the word triggered, although there's a part of me that really, like that really dark, sinful part of me that wants to say that, that everybody that uses the word triggered is insane. But I'm just going to tell you, if you are willing to ascribe credibility to the comments made by this man who attacked Dave Chappelle on stage for jokes that he made, then, then that's part of the problem, is that we need to get back to the place where we are willing to call a spade a spade and just say this, that if you are triggered by a joke, then you either need to turn the channel or you need to get a sense of humor. Now, I, I get it. I, there's all sorts of joking that I don't like. I personally don't listen to jokes with a bunch of profanity in it. So. I don't really even listen to Dave Chappelle that much. So I'm only calling him kind of a cultural icon in the sense that he is a cultural icon, not because I even like him. But what I do when I don't like comedy is I turn the channel. That's the, the most logical response. If in any way, this report about what happened with Dave Chappelle is an attempt to try to get us to repent of, of pointing out the fact that there are some things that are kind of funny about the LGBTQ community. There's some things that are kind of funny about their arguments and the things that they say. And, and, and if we can't talk about that, we're not better as a society. So I'll just say this, at the end of the day, I'm gonna side with the sane people. 
And I think we should be thinking deeply about what it means when our society tries to ascribe credibility to people who are not mentally healthy. And, and, and then I would go as far as to say this, is the whole idea of being triggered, is that something that needs to be rethought? Is that something that we need to push back against and realize that just because somebody says they're triggered doesn't give them the right to then act socially unacceptable? Uh, the fact is, is that there's all sorts of things that can trigger all sorts of people. But we used to live in a society where people had to deal with their own, their own issues uh, and, and they didn't blame other people for, for their issues. Uh, now, maybe we haven't always perfectly lived in that kind of society and, I'm, and that's an idealistic statement, but, I, but at least we can say it would be better, right? It would be better if we took personal responsibility instead of blaming other people for making us rush up on stage and attack somebody at a show. So suffice to say, I'll just round out by saying this. Uh, Dave Chappelle's attacker shouldn't be given the, the credibility of, of an article about his statements, nor should the Buffalo shooter or any other mass shooter be given the credibility of reading their memoirs and ascribing anything accurate to, to their intentions. At the end of the day, these people are not right in the head, so anything that they would say ultimately loses all of its credibility because it's not coming from a coherent place. These people are sick and they need help. And so to talk about whether or not we should be triggering people, uh, and even too with the, the whole Buffalo shooter thing, whether or not we should be taking guns from people misses the point, and it doesn't make us better because we should be talking about mental health and we should be talking about spiritual health. And that's why We'll end the show today with our final segment, Christianity Not Today. So recently Ben Shapiro had Jonathan Isaac, the NBA player, on his show because they just did a book with Jonathan Isaac, with, uh, Daily Wire did. And his book was all about his decision to stand in the midst of the Black Lives Matter uh, summer of 2020 uh, at, in the NBA bubble, I believe, is where he did that while all of his teammates uh, took a knee in, in protest. Uh, so Jonathan Isaac wanted to speak up and share why he decided to stand, and that's why he wrote the book, Why I Stand. And so the show was great. Uh, Jonathan Isaac is just such a breath of fresh air. He's such an unapologetic Christian, and, and he has kind of the the benefit of the credibility of being a pretty good basketball player too. So it's not just that he's uh, proselytizing merely, but that he's also uh, a, a, a fantastic player and a fantastic dude. And I just think that that's, that's rare. Uh, so needless to say, I think what he has to say really is, really is helpful. Uh, but when he took his stand, he was immediately attacked by players uh, and his own teammates for, um, for being an Uncle Tom. So they immediately attacked him for not standing up for the cause that they thought he should stand up for. And so again, I want you to watch the show because it was great, but I also want to point out something. This dude has the right to protest the way that he wants to protest, right? Just like those guys had a right to take a knee and then people have a right to talk about it. But being called an Uncle Tom, I mean, it's not only not nice, it's deeply revealing. Yeah, you can call anybody names and call them what they want, and of course we need to have thick skin, but it reveals something that's worth talking about. It reveals, once again, that humans are predisposed to emotionalism rather than rationalism. Isn't the correct response, let's hear what the guy has to say, let's hear his argument, let's hear why he's standing and not, and, and not just immediately jump to ad hominem attacks on the guy because he doesn't do what I think he should do. So let's hear from Isaac himself on why he stood. And in today's day, there are so many things that you can be so afraid of standing for if you believe them because of what could come out of it. And so in the moment, there, there was a lot of fear about what, what's going to happen with my contract. What are people going to say about me? But um, I knew what I was standing for. And what the book details is me saying that Jesus, the love of Jesus Christ is the answer is because I've experienced it in my own life. Christ's love isn't like everybody else's love. It's not like the world's love. The world's love loves you when you do things right or when you do things with them. But as soon as you make a mistake, they take that love away. But what I've experienced with the love of Christ is that it loves first. It loves through wrongdoing. It loves, it loves when you shouldn't be loved anymore. It's unconditional. And that's the love that I believe is going to change the world and has changed me. His argument is that the cure for racism actually isn't political. Okay, well, that's actually a good argument. Let's put that to the test. Are race relations better after the BLM riots of 2020? According to the very left guardian, racial tensions have increased 55% because of BLM. 
And it doesn't stop there. According to Forbes, race relations are at an all-time low following the summer of 2020. At the same time, support for BLM experienced a sharp decline. So not to mention, it, it should suffice that we have heard sparingly little from the BLM uh, people after accumulating $90 million in donations now that the 2020 elections are conveniently over. It seems clear that BLM has been more of a blight than a respite from the problem of racism. And by the way, throughout this, I do not suggest that racism doesn't exist. I do believe it's probably less prevalent than those in the news media would want you to believe. Sure, it exists and it should be fight, but we fought, but we must ask what will make the greatest difference? And what has made the greatest difference in American history in terms of civil rights? Oh yeah, it's a pastor extolling Christian virtues and the beauty of America's founding principles. That's what made the biggest difference. Since that has a clear track record, I say we go back to that old well and see if we can't find some good water in it. How about we explore faith in America as a cure for polarization, as a cure for intense politicization and racism, rather than claims of systemic racism? How about we get back to individual racism found in the human heart? Is it because there's more obscurity in systems than in people? Because racism is a sin issue of the human heart, not a system issue. Is it at least possible that race huster, hucksters like Sharpton don't want you to focus on faith because they know it's a potent answer? It could actually solve the problem and it could spoil the Ponzi scheme that's been pulled over on the American people since all of this stuff started happening. So basically what I'm saying at the end of the day, faith, spirituality, Christianity proper is the reason that so much has been done in the name of civil rights. And at the end of the day, we need that if we're going to reclaim an answer to so many of these problems. So did Jonathan Isaac take a good stand when he stood? I think undeniably, yes. You may disagree with Christianity, but it is impossible to be intellectually honest and deny that, he was, that Jonathan Isaac was standing upon at least some pretty solid principles when he did it. So at the end of the day, what am I saying? Jesus is the answer, and you need Jesus, and I need Jesus. But that's also why I say race extortion, not today. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if this video was helpful to you, uh, or if this podcast was helpful to you. If you are listening, we'll catch you next time. You can catch brand new episodes of Indie Thinker with Reed Uberman every Monday and weekly bonus episodes to keep you thinking throughout the week. But you have to subscribe and click the bell to be notified when new episodes drop. If you enjoy this content, make sure to like this video and share it with friends.